Hello, and welcome to the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I am the Executive Director of the Fellowship Program. The Radcliffe Institute brings together students, scholars, and practitioners from across disciplines and the professions to create and share transformative ideas. You can participate in these laboratory of ideas by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collection held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more about Radcliffe, please feel free to sign up to receive information on news and events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. We'll begin the program with a presentation from Professor Leslie Harris. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce this year's Beatrice Shepherd Blaine Fellow, Leslie Harris. She is Professor of History and African American Studies at Northwestern University. She is a brilliant and accomplished scholar, best known as a historian of slavery. Importantly, Professor Harris's work is interdisciplinary in nature. She is a scholar of US and African American history, whose research extends to the areas of climate change and public policy. In her first book, In the Shadow of Slavery, African Americans in New York City, Leslie outlines the previously overlooked impact of the city's black population on class, politics, and the community of New York City from arrival of the first slaves in 1626 to the years before emancipation in 1827. With this work, Leslie led the way of scholarly research into slavery in the northern colonies of British America. Following her first book, Professor Harris co-edited four collections of essays. Slavery in New York was published in conjunction with an exhibition of the same name at the New York Historical Society. This work propelled Leslie's extraordinary career of public and professional engagement. She has been interviewed on CBS News, BBC and NPR, as well as in the New York Times and the Washington Post, among other newspapers. Professor Harris has proven herself to be a leader by co-founding and directing Emory's Transforming Community Project, which examined the role of race in the institution and the nation. Speaking to audiences at Harvard, Princeton, Duke, the University of Alabama, among others, Leslie opened the door to a wider and overdue reckoning of America, American universities and their role in perpetrating racial inequalities and injustice. At Radcliffe, Leslie is writing Living New Orleans, A Personal Urban History, a book in which she weaves the history of her family with the history of New Orleans. She uses the events during and after Hurricane Katrina and her family history to interrogate the meaning of race, class, and the environment in New Orleans from the period before the Civil War to today's ongoing struggle with climate change. More generally, Leslie's project asks us to consider the nation's promises to make New Orleans whole in the aftermath of Katrina and whether, whether those promises will hold in the face of climate change. And now it is my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Leslie Harris. Thank you, Claudia, for that generous introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, coming out today, joining us uh, from near and far. In 2005, my life cracked open in a number of ways. As Claudia has described, I am known for my participation in a number of public history projects, and 2005 was the year that my life really opened up in that way. The Slavery in New York show at the New York Historical Society, a path-breaking museum exhibition that set the standard for museums to diversify their offerings, put my first body of work on enslaved and free African Americans on a public national and international stage. And I also launched the Transforming Community Project at Emory University that fall, a highly experimental endeavor that I had spent the previous two years co-developing with colleagues. Through that work, I became part of the movement to study slavery and universities. 
Both of these events in my career occurred in the same year that Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, my hometown and the place where my parents, two sisters, five nephews, and a host of extended family lived. Many still live there today. For years after the fall of 2005, I often felt that each of these events had happened to me separately in separate years even, but they had all come to land at the same time. This year, I hope to complete my book manuscript, Leaving New Orleans, which will help me to make sense of the impact of Hurricane Katrina on the city and on my life, and the ways in which 2005 was just the beginning of our realization of the new reality of climate change. I use Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath as the spine of the book, which enables me to explore the meaning of New Orleans to the nation, and the ways in which histories of race and racism, from slavery through Jim Crow segregation to the present moment, affect the decisions we make about who and what are part of this nation, the United States, and who is not. Two central questions in the book are, what does it mean for a Black family to be upwardly mobile in a downwardly mobile city? And second, what does it mean for a nation to lose a city? We have already lost some cities in this nation economically. I would argue we left behind Detroit and New Orleans and many others. And amid the pandemic, our current administration is claiming that some cities are anarchist cities and deserve to be excluded from federal grants. But we are also set to literally physically lose some cities, not only New Orleans, but perhaps Miami and a number of other coastal cities, even parts of New York City, um, due to rising waters. What happens when a nation can jettison places and people, not just politically, but permanently? This is a deeply personal book, as well as a book in which I use my academic research skills. I can't imagine a better place to work on this book that brings both of those elements of my writing life together than the Radcliffe Institute. And I wanna just say again, how grateful I am to be a part of the Radcliffe community this year and how fortunate I feel that we're able to continue in the face of the pandemic. Today, I'm gonna to read two sections of uh, the book. I'm calling the first section, Why Would Anyone Ever Live There? and the second section I'm calling Beauty. Why would anyone ever live there? My family, as did all the people of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, had an ever-present knowledge of the potential of hurricanes to engulf the city and the region. In my lifetime before Katrina, that knowledge was reinforced by the experiences of Hurricane Betsy in 1965 and Hurricane Camille in 1969. Family stories of hurricanes were passed down through the years. It seems I already, always knew not only that I was born in February of 1965, but also that I spent September 9th of that year with my mother and grandmother in the brick wall protection of my grandmother's apartment in the Lafitte housing project in the Treme district. My father was at work that night at Charity Hospital as an orderly. I apparently slept through the storm while my mother and grandmother listened to the wind through the night. We all survived, my family did, as the metropolitan area and especially the Ninth Ward, the former swampland deemed good enough for blacks and immigrants to own in, uh, property in, flooded and drained. Some of my earliest memories of television, along with the moonwalk, were of a local documentary of the devastation of Hurricane Camille, complete with creep show organ music that I watched one night at my cousin's house in rural reserve, Louisiana. We always knew what was possible. By the time of Hurricane Camille, which just missed New Orleans to destroy coastal Mississippi, even more swampland had been reclaimed in New Orleans, this time to create middle-class black and white suburbs near Lake Pontchartrain, both to the west and to the east. Areas that my parents would move to in the mid-1980s, areas that would prove to be as vulnerable to inundation by floodwaters as the Ninth Ward when Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005. The continuing reclamation of swampland in a city below sea level and prone to brutal storms was rooted in a 20th century optimism and perhaps greed that matched that of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century Europeans who brought enslaved Africans with them to claim New Orleans and lower Louisiana, claim New Orleans from the Mississippi River and from the Native Americans resident there. From the time of its earliest settlements, New Orleans had always been known for danger, disease, and flooding. But the residents of New Orleans were always watchful. 
Many floods after spring and summer storms reminded us of just how antiquated were the pumping stations and inadequate the gutters. And every year brought the strange thrill of hurricane season, which began with getting a free hurricane tracking map from Katz and Betzoff, the local chain drugstore no known for its signature lurid purple color. The K and B maps were also printed in purple, the Gulf of Mexico a grid where I penciled in the hurricane tracks, some years with more interest than others. As the hurricane approached, there was mingled fear and anticipation. Most scary to me and my sisters was the dread of the electricity going out, especially when it was hot and muggy. Candles and flashlights to guide us if we had to get up in the middle of the night. With the storm's arrival, the sound of the wind, the lashing rain, and then the eerie quiet of the eye. If by day, could we go outside and look around? What if we didn't make it back inside before the other harsher side of the storm began again? The green sky, and then that worse half, the other side of the eye. If at night, would we sleep through it? Would that branch come through the window? Should we hide under the bed? Waking up to a cleansed world. Deep water collected here and there, wind still vibrant, moving through live oak and pecan trees where we lived at the Dillard University apartments, or winding through the weeping willow of our house on Castiglione Street, but not as dangerous or violent. Windows wide to the fresh smells. Had those smells and that wind traveled all the way in from the Caribbean or Africa? And a few days later, back to school and back to work, back to normal. We were vulnerable in New Orleans, but not so vulnerable as the coastal towns of Louisiana, which always evacuated at the faintest hint of a storm. Names like Cameron, Grand Isle, and Plaquemines Parish. Their names intertwined also with half-explained stories of brutal racism and violence, the Klan, perhaps. Things that never happened in New Orleans, it seemed. To those who hadn't grown up with it, it probably seemed foolish, living in a beautiful but poor city in a seemingly unredeemable floodplain with a weak economy. I just would never live there. That's what Jenkins, the forest expert in charge of a group hike I attended in North Georgia said. It was two months after Katrina. People do stupid things. Well, how did it get that way in New Orleans, asked Gideon, a fellow hiker. The city didn't consult you folks, you environmentalists, as it grew? Well, New Orleans is an old city, said Jenkins. And that was the truth of it. New Orleans' site on the Mississippi was not the result of stupidity. Like many old cities and even newer suburbs and planned communities, its origins mix politics, grand and petty, luck, good and bad, and perhaps most importantly, desire and persistence. European explorers seeking their fortunes gambled and lost repeatedly in the region. Indeed, embedded in the French nation's desire to, to secure its North American empire in the 17th and 18th centuries by conquering the lower Mississippi Valley were the individual decisions made by European colonists on the ground, who chose a location for the French capital that would enable them, they hoped, to find their own fortunes there. Although available to the ocean on the one hand and the Mississippi on the ri river on the other, New Orleans was never an ideal location, but few settlements are. By the 19th century, the hard work and sacrifices of those who lived there, willingly or not, had made New Orleans the wealthiest city in the United States, even as its location made it the deadliest. Any participant in colonial enterprises in the quote unquote new world was subject to challenges regardless of location. One might ask what sent anyone to any part of the Americas. The loss of whole towns of settlers seemed to be the initial price to be paid for most European settlements, either through warfare, through disease, or the simple inability to grow and harvest their own food or provide their own shelter. When the lower Louisiana European settlers built shacks of mud and cypress bark, they differed little from their late 17th century predecessors in New Amsterdam, later New York who lived in trenches lined with bark for the first years of their settlement. European residents in both regions relied on native and African knowledge, skills, and labor, often coerced to survive. Although the establishment of New Orleans was fraught with danger, by the dawning of the 19th century, it was on the verge of financial success. Although he did not bring it to full fruition, Bienville, the founder of New Orleans, saw the Mississippi River system as, quote, the most magnificent collection of highways in the world, a system shaped like a large funnel with its spout pointed at New Orleans. 
By the time of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, the city's potential was even more clear. New Orleans, quote, is destined by its very situation to, the be, to be the center of an immense commerce between all nations, said Baron de Carondelet in 1794. For President Thomas Jefferson, engineer of the Louisiana Purchase, New Orleans was, quote, on the globe, one single spot that will be forever as it is now, the mighty mark of the merchandise brought from more than a thousand rivers. No such position for the accumulation and perpetuity of wealth and power ever existed. In the first decades of the 19th century, the Mississippi River brought millions of dollars of goods from the North American continent into the port of New Orleans. Combined with goods arriving from the Atlantic world via the Gulf of Mexico, New Orleans became the leading port in the United States, vying with New York for that title into the 20th century. By 1840, this port traffic combined with slave produced cotton and sugar from lower Louisiana, as well as slaves themselves, to make New Orleans the wealthiest city and its free blacks the wealthiest community of African descended people in the nation. Although New Orleans lost this status as the wealthiest city in the nation by the 20th century, at the time of Katrina, the port of New Orleans still contained the longest wharf in the world and was at the helm of the busiest waterway in the world. Enslaved Blacks were the engines of this great success. Slaves were a central component of Southern and thus national wealth. In New Orleans, slave and land ownership translated to market goods, and the city also relied on a Black slave labor force, even as it employed a large number of skilled free Blacks as well. In addition to this urban Black population, the rural plantations surrounding New Orleans were home to slave owners who also owned vast swaths of land. These large and successful cotton and sugar plantations were known for some of the harshest labor regimes in the slave South. Being sold down the river to New Orleans was more than a metaphor to 19th century African Americans. When my mother's and father's ancestors arrived in New Orleans and lower Louisiana in the early 19th century, the answer to why would anyone ever live there for people of African descent was often, I had no choice. In the 20th century, as some left the South for Northern and Western locales as part of the Great Migration, most of my family remained in Louisiana and New Orleans. In addition to a movement from Southern rural areas to Northern urban areas, there is still a significant and still under-recognized number who moved from Southern rural areas to Southern cities, and New Orleans was a popular destination for many. Through the 1960s, New Orleans retained a reputation as a city that was better on race relations than other Southern cities. The 19th century tradition of Black home ownership, the highly skilled laborers of African descent, and the strong economy rooted in the port meant that the city had a higher rate of home ownership among Blacks than comparable cities. New Orleans also had a lower index of residential segregation in the city center than did other Southern cities and the rich distinctive culture there from music to food waste to language made it unique in the nation in ways that residents were unable to duplicate elsewhere. On the eve of Katrina, Louisiana was still the place in the nation with the highest percentage of its population that was native born that had never left. But some of us, okay me, could not imagine staying there. I'm the product of families that have been in Lower Louisiana since 1800, as long as any other non-native claimants to that land. And I left as soon as I could at age 18. And for at least a decade before that, I told everyone I knew that I was leaving. At the same time, I always knew that I would someday write a book about New Orleans, my New Orleans, one which would not be about jazz or Bourbon Street or Mardi Gras, but would be about the people I knew. After I became an historian, I thought, that meant that I could do that book without talking too much about myself. I would spill some secrets about the real New Orleans, but not about me. Hurricane Katrina forced my hand, however. It made me realize that I needed to spill some personal secrets as well and come to terms with my own troubled relationship to the place of my birth. It has taken me years to acknowledge how New Orleans has shaped everything I have years to accept the place of my birth as a place of pride, years to accept my inheritance and the responsibilities that come with it as complex as it is. 
when I was in college in the mid 80s, a friend saw a picture of St. Louis Cathedral, a popular poster of the time, a photograph taken of the cathedral at night, wreathed in mist and fog. You live in a place that looks like that, she said, enviously, almost disbelieving. She was from New Jersey. I shrugged. So what? I thought, for those are the ways of children. Your mother is so beautiful. Your father is so handsome. Your parents are so nice. There's so much fun. You look just like your mother. You sound like your father. When do we learn to embrace our parents and all that they have given us? When do we stop running away? Beauty. When I was growing up in New Orleans, there was one thing I knew about my parents, I thought. That's that my mother's family were Creoles and my father's family were not. In Louisiana, among African Americans, Creoles refers to people of partial African descent who can trace their family tree back to partial French or uh, Spanish descent. They may have been born free or gained freedom before the Civil War. Before the Civil War, they may have spoken French. They were Catholic, not Protestant. They owned real estate, and maybe they owned slaves. Many associate Creoles with being light-skinned as well. My mother's family had owned land in a town west of New Orleans called Reserve, Louisiana since the 19th century. But my mother, as is true of many Creoles of African descent after the Civil Rights Movement, had rejected many of the invidious distinctions that grew up between alleged Creoles and non-Creoles, between light-skinned and dark-skinned Blacks, and had disclaimed that, Negro, that Creole heritage, excuse me, to a large degree. Still, in the 1980s, my mother began examining her family tree and discovered that her grandfather, Louis Paraloo, the son of Elodie Robinette, carried the same last name as a wealthy white landowner. We believe, as best we can tell, that Elodie had six children by this landowner, and these children, including Louis, carried his name, not hers. In addition, we believe that this white landowner gave Elodie Robinette and her brother Leo Robinette the money to buy a large plot of land in Reserve, Louisiana, which they did on Valentine's Day in 1873. And my mother's family still lives on that land. My father's family, on the other hand, had no Creole heritage. Instead, they were often dismissive of Creoles of African descent, no doubt because of the claims of many self-identifying Creoles to elitism and privilege. Indeed, both my parents were often dismissive of the ways of some New Orleans Creoles, the coming out parties for daughters, the fawning over light skin and family heritage. Indeed, my mother had a curious relationship to her search for her roots. She was at once determined to find out more and careful not to lay claim to too much about what it all meant. My father grew up Protestant descendant of a father who did not claim that Creole, partly color-based privilege, who married a dark-skinned woman, my grandmother. For her, he left behind his color-struck relatives. His mother, my great-grandmother, Zulima, had also rejected Creole skin color privilege. My father and his brothers and sisters always said those Creoles with a slight sneer in their voices, a disdain. As a child, my father once met a cousin so light that he later asked his father, who was that white boy? That was your cousin, my grandfather told him. But I never met that part of my family as a child. My father himself was the most fair of his siblings. They called him Red as a child, but he was nowhere near as fair as my own two younger uh, sisters. If my father's family rejected Creole legacies, my mother literally embodied them. She was not bright white, as they say, but light. And most especially, she possessed the thick, not straight hair that to me seemed to be the goal of so many little black girls in New Orleans. Now, this is not straight hair. It's strong, dark, curly, long, and unruly. Almond eyes, smooth, light brown skin. Today, many people would probably ask her if she's biracial. As a child, many people asked her if she was Mexican or even Chinese. It was too dangerous to ask the more logical question in a city that had been at the center of the fancy trade, where white men traveled from across the South to purchase black women as concubines. Who's the white man in your family tree? 
To ask that question would be to open up questions of illicit sex, but also of property ownership and inheritances misdirected from children with mothers of African descent. My father met my mother in the neighborhood drugstore where she worked after school near the Lafitte housing project they both lived in. They had not known each other before then, even though they lived within blocks of each other. My mother's mother, a single parent raising two children, had worked two jobs to send my mother to the most elite Catholic uh, girls school in the city, a black Catholic girls school in the city, St. Mary's Academy, founded by Henriette DeLille just before the Civil War. DeLille was a Creole woman of partial African descent who had rejected being placed with a white man as his concubine but instead founded an order of nuns for black women trying to avoid such fates. Now, my mother didn't simply attend St. Mary's. She excelled there, both as a beauty and as a brain, a cheerleader, member of the homecoming court, third place winner in the statewide mathematics contest and salutatorian of her class. She then went on to be among the first students to desegregate the University of New Orleans and became a math teacher. My father, one of 12 brothers and sisters, attended the public high school Clark that served the neighborhood and after graduation went to work. He had started college before he met my mother, but flunked out. And then he worked in a dry goods store across the street from the drugstore where she worked and then went to the army. He completed his BA after they married in English and Spanish and became a teacher, first in high school and then in adult education. But even before my father met my mother, he was reclaiming another important part of Creole identity, Catholicism. But in marrying my mother, he met a secular believer. She refuted the mysticism, mysticism of Catholicism, didn't believe in ghosts, didn't make novenas as her mother, my grandmother did. She didn't understand why I was disappointed when on confirmation, I didn't feel the flames of the Holy Ghost making an imprint on my heart. She didn't understand my fascination with exorcisms, with ghosts, with death, or my search for a feeling of true belief. My father didn't speak of those things either, but as he grew older, he became more spiritual, concerned about heaven and whether I, who left the church in my 20s, would meet him there in the afterlife. Once he came to New York to hear me give a talk, we met in a restaurant. I saw him cross the street in a Mandarin collared shirt wearing a large, a large cross on a leather rope. He looked like a priest out for a stroll on a Saturday. When he gave me a hug, I picked up the cross and I held it against my forehead and I made a burning sound like a vampire. It's burning, it's burning me. Anyway, together my parents and their families embody the ups and downs of African American life in Louisiana, the highs and lows economically and socially. They were upwardly mobile, part of a burgeoning middle class that no longer relied on Creole legacies, but rather began to live into the promise of the civil rights movement. They were not activists in the street during that time, but they took advantage of the openings the movement created and not just for themselves, but for their students, the children my mother taught and the adult learners my father taught. They were part of the generation that ref refused to lay any importance in the distinctions of quote unquote Creole identity. But as an observant child, I had questions, lots of questions. Why did everyone in my family look so different? A girlfriend would later call us a sitcom family. Different hair, textures, height, skin colors, body types. There seemed to be few similarities among we four sisters. Those physical differences mattered enormously in the schools we attended. Other children judged us by them. What sense were we to make of them? Both my parents were united in their ridicule of Creole heirs, Creole elitism, colorism. They feared that we, their children, would not learn the right lessons about race and color and physical beauty. For them, attention to physical appearance was to be tightly controlled and contained. Just enough attention to our hair, our clothing, and our presence to be respectable, but not too much. Not a distraction from education, the most important thing. Their solution to the comparisons people made among us was to ignore them and encourage us to ignore them. But they left me with a vacuum of unanswered questions. Once when we were driving to church, I asked my father if my mother was light enough to pass for white. My father nearly ran off the road. What? Don't you ever ask that? Where would you get an idea like that? 
I had been reading about people who passed for white and I, I just couldn't picture it. Besides, my parents often claim their ability to see race in allegedly white people. They claim to be able to deduce African ancestries and a fullness of the lips, a slightly tawny skin, hair that was a little too curly. As a child, I attended a black Catholic school in which hair colors range from blonde to brown to black, skin colors from fair to brown to dark, hair textures from completely straight to kinky. How did one attain that curious sixth sense about race? Where was the color line exactly? And why couldn't white people tell who was passing and who wasn't? More importantly, if I couldn't tell, how would I learn it? I was left to squint at black and white photos in my mother's yearbook from St. Mary's Academy of light-skinned, wavy-haired men and women. What made the color line? But more interesting to me than passing for white was the range of beauty markers within my family and our world. My sister Jennifer, closest in age to me, was the spitting image of my mother, a little more brown, but the same hair, smile, and eyes. Pictures of them as children were hard to distinguish. I knew my mother was a great beauty for her time. Both she and my sister both embodied the perfect combination of smooth brown skin, crinkly hair, almond-shaped eyes. To me and to many, they were the most beautiful people anyone knew. Whereas I could never keep my hair in order, my skin tone seemed to me by comparison sallow and unattractive, and I was always, always too tall. Who knows how some girls and women know how to put themselves together, learn how, and some don't. No matter how much makeup my mother bought me from Avon and Mary Kay and Ron Norman, I couldn't make it happen. The dresses that I liked she thought were unattractive. Despite her best efforts, I felt clumsy and awkward. Although feminism might have been leading the way for women to do away with makeup in other parts of the country, the women I knew in the Deep South weren't on that bandwagon in the late 70s and early 80s. I began to make choices in high school that felt more true to me, but it would be decades before I felt fully in my own skin, not attempting to attain a goal I wasn't interested in or adept at. But my clumsiness and my lack of beauty in comparison to my mother and my sisters did not spare me from the street harassment of the city. I can only see now how attractive youth is to men, no matter how awkward or young or unknowing the young woman. My senior year in high school, I decided to attend a band concert uptown at Loyola University. Wearing a gauzy floor length maxi skirt and shirt that I had made myself, I walked along St. Charles Avenue looking at the big garden district mansions, dreaming of my future. It was one of the last concerts before graduation. My boyfriend was playing in the band. I was going to listen. I had a small gift for him that I bought on a trip to Disney World. A car pulled up alongside me and stopped, and a young man in his 20s jumped out. Hey, what's your name? I'd like to talk to you. No, no thank you, I said, and picked up my pace. He followed me for a block a long, hot block. Frustrated at my pretending that he wasn't there and my refusal to answer his questions, he became more insulting. I can see straight through your dress. I can see your underwear. I looked at the big houses, all owned by white, stores closed. In all the years I'd walked by them or ridden by on the streetcar, I'd never seen one door open. If I ran up to one of those imposing doors now, would they let me in? Would they help me call the police? Or would they just watch from behind the curtains as this man continued to berate me? When I arrived at the concert, I told my boyfriend what had happened. What's wrong with you? Why didn't you give him some time? Help a brother out. Well, that wasn't the right response. I was only beginning to, be to develop my own sense of my beauty, to figure out what kind of person I wanted to present to the world, how my body moved through space and in relation to other people. I had begun to believe that I could only realize this new self outside New Orleans, away from so many people who only knew me one way. The persistent attention of random men on the streets of New Orleans was completely irrelevant. I would not find answers to any questions I had about myself from them. But I also knew that my boyfriend was frustrated because I wouldn't go to a friend's apartment with him, wouldn't spend an afternoon lying down in a big bed with him. He was my dream lover. I couldn't believe that he had asked me to the prom, that he thought I was attractive. I thought we could get married and raise a family of dancers and musicians together. I wanted us to nurture a family of artists and to live in a big house with lots of soulful children, but not yet. 
I knew I had to get out of New Orleans and I couldn't risk that for anything. I loved him, but I loved my future beyond New Orleans more. He would leave too. He was a member of a famous musical family and had already spent summers at Tanglewood. He was going to Berkeley College of Music after graduation. I was going even farther away to an extra year of school at a boarding school in England before I went to New York, my dream city for college. I thought it was the center of all that was culturally important. It was more important for me to be in New York than it was to be in the Ivy League school located there. No, nope, I couldn't risk it. I had to leave New Orleans. Nothing could stand in the way of that. I had been clear about my own limited opportunities in New Orleans. Throughout high school, I plotted my getaway, and in 1983, I succeeded one of thousands who left the city, planning never to return. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, that was a great, uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, we have a question, which apparently is the standard question for uh, New Orleans, which is, what high school did you attend? And <laughs> you I, um, I went to Franklin High School, Ben Franklin High School. Um, I went to grade school, uh, K through eight at uh, St. Raymond's uh, School, and then I went to Franklin for high school. But all my sisters went to St. Mary's Academy, so I was the odd one out. Uh, another question asked, um, who is the intended audience of your book? Um, a general audience, other historians, city planners, climate change activists, or all of the above? Well, you know, anybody who wants to read it, it is, I did begin it by thinking that it's a, it's a, it's a book for a general audience. I think um, there are so many people who visit New Orleans or who want to visit New Orleans. Um, and so I think there is a general audience for it. Um, uh, so, so all of the above. But, you know, the more I've been working on it and writing it, I also remain very curious about what New Orleanians will think of it. Um, and so I'll be really interested in that audience as well, very much. So someone apparently is asking where your beautiful parents are now. They are in New Orleans. They are, uh, uh, they're there. Uh, yeah, they're still in New Orleans and healthy and um, as happy as anyone can be in a pandemic, so. Yeah, wonderful to hear. Um, the next question is, uh, could you talk a little bit about what it means to, for, an, for a historian to study uh, oneself and her own family? Mm -hmm. It's uh, been challenging. So writing this book has been uh, really different from the other books I've written. Um, the, uh, the first thing was that it's not the kind of book that I wanted to go and learn every single thing about New Orleans and Black people there the way I did with my book on New York. And so um, combining memoir and myself and the history, uh, it took me a while to figure out how to do it. Um, historians sometimes are, we're told or we're trained, you know, that we're supposed to be objective in some kind of way. Um, but this book really pushes back against this idea of objectivity. So um, what I've been doing is writing the personal parts first and then stepping back and thinking about how to situate them historically. And so letting questions about, well, what does it mean that I was born in 1965? What does Hurricane Betsy mean? Um, so then I step back and think about that historical context that I was living through. But of course, as an individual, I didn't necessarily have knowledge of. Um, but it's been a very complicated project in that way. Um, so uh, a member of there said, beautiful presentation. I know this is somewhat beyond the project purview, uh, but I wondered Leslie's response to the growing public discussion of climate migration within the US to the fraught question it raises of justice and equity. It's, it's not actually beyond uh, the project necessarily, certainly in the, uh, right after Katrina and even um, now the question of what uh, should happen um, to people who lost their homes, you know, many people, so many people were displaced. I mean, the emptying out of the city of New Orleans right after Katrina is an example of climate migration, certainly. Um, and many people uh, were displaced for months or even years. Um, and we still, the city still has not come back in terms of its population, in terms of absolute numbers to what it was 
um, at the moment of Katrina. So we already are living in a moment of um, uh, uh, climate migration. And of course, we're watching the fires in California. This is not new anywhere. Um, you know, this is really the question for the nation. Um, uh, the, uh, Jenkins, the guy I quote, who said, why would anyone live there? He's one of many people who asked that question at that time. And, um, but there's a bigger question if we are a nation as opposed, and of course we're having that this debate right now amid the pandemic. If we are a nation, what is our responsibility to each other in order to address what might need to happen, which is that people may really need to evacuate New Orleans. It might need to be left behind at some point. We're already experiencing that in um, the places south of New Orleans. Um, there was a New York Times Magazine article in the last month about um, a woman who's part of a community south of New Orleans who had built her own shrimping business from the ground up and who's being told that she has to leave. And the problem is, is that people are being told they have to leave, but they're not being told what they're supposed to do with these things that they've invested their, literally their lives. And, and they're not being given, uh, they're not being helped to explore what the alternative is. They're just being told you have to get out. And that was very much the experience of the evacuation of New Orleans. There are many accounts of people who were put on planes, they didn't even know where the plane was going. So we can't do that kind of migration. <laughs> That's not fair to anyone. It's not fair to the people who have to move, who are in an emergency, and it's certainly not fair to the communities that um, have to receive them. So it, it, it very much is a, a, a very basic question of justice, and, and it's a little bit frustrating that um, we are exploring all the push factors, but we're not exploring where people uh, are gonna end up. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real problem, it's a real issue. No, no planning around that. So we have a couple of questions around beauty. Um, as I listened to your words on beauty, on embracing your own, developing your own, I thought about the parallels with New Orleans, uh, trying to uh, rebeautify, refurbish, dare I say it, gentrify, can you comment on this? No, oh, that's a great question and a great comparison. I, you know, there is now a gentrification, but you know, the other thing about growing up in New Orleans, it's, a, you know, so my parents, their first house was an old house that they renovated um, in a neighborhood. I kind of describe this neighborhood. So it's an old neighborhood. It had been probably predominantly white. Uh, it did have some black families. We were a younger black family moving in. There were older white people who lived there. And so um, I don't know, I haven't thought about us as gentrifiers, but we definitely took a house and then refurbished it. And um, uh, we brought it up to date, I guess. And so there's that kind of taking um, uh, something, and New Orleans is full of old houses, beautiful old houses. And so how do we preserve them? And I always thought that one of the things that they could have done in the aftermath of Katrina is bring so many young people back and teach them those skills of preservation and rebuilding and refurbishing. Instead, we, we did get the gentrification, which was people who had a lot of money from places outside of New Orleans who were able to buy up, you know, this incredibly inexpensive property by comparison to New York or California. So, um, so I think that um, I, I hadn't thought though about that real estate, uh, you know, the connection of the city and to beauty. And um, hopefully we can, I don't know how we think of our way out of gentrification. That's a, question for a lot of people. We have uh, another question on beauty. Um, that was a profoundly moving talk. This is the first um, comment. Uh, how do you connect your reflections on physical beauty with the careful and complex history of New Orleans as a place? What role does perceiving beauty play in the way we approach questions of climate change? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really difficult because I think, you know, New Orleans is an incredibly beautiful place. And I think many of the people who visit and um, uh, who, who maybe who don't live there, but who have encountered New Orleans, many of the people I talk to from outside when I say I'm from New Orleans, oh, it's so beautiful. I had such a beautiful time there. People feel really transformed by New Orleans. And yet, I think one of the challenges, and this is true of a lot of places that are places of restoration, tourist places, right, is that they are rarely seen as central to 
the nation or the globe or whatever. You can think of, you know, the places in the Caribbean that are incredibly beautiful. Those two are, are at risk. And so um, there's a way in which simply being beautiful is not enough. You know, and I think that's probably the lesson my parents are trying to tell us too. You can't just be beautiful. You have to be smart. You have to, you know, have something else. And certainly for New Orleans, it was, it may have always been beautiful in a certain kind of way, but um, as it lost economic power in the nation, it lost power, period. Not to mention the state of Louisiana. If you compare Louisiana, which had access to oil, to Texas, which had, has access to oil, the fate of those two states, which are in the same geographic area, are very different in terms of uh, the politics of our nation, in terms of the, the power that they wield. And so um, beauty is not enough, unfortunately. I guess is what I'll say today. Definitely. Um, the next question. Uh, in the process of researching your family and personal history, did you discover anything you didn't know before Anything that surprised you? A lot of, uh, I discovered a lot of things I didn't know before. It's it, the first thing that was so interesting about going back and looking at these things as an historian and even looking at family stories was realizing um, what I heard and understood as a child was not correct. So for example, the ownership of that land in my mother's family, I had assumed that that had happened in the antebellum period, but it happened during reconstruction. And that's a, a relatively small thing, but it, it's, it's interesting that um, that happened then. And um, there are elements of my father's family that we knew nothing about that we discovered in terms of um, ancestry and how his family came to be in uh, Louisiana as well. Um, so it turns out that um, one of the themes of the book a little bit is gonna be how, what we decide to keep as a family or what family stories remain and which ones don't and why. You know, I mentioned that my uh, great grandmother Zulaima sort of rejected um, some of the uh, stories of her family. I'm gonna talk about that more in the book. And um, I'm not sure yet how I wanna think about how that relates to what people's goals are for their children and themselves when they say, I don't, you know, we're just gonna forget about this ancestor, we're going to forget about this part of the family. But I think that's true for a lot of families. And I've been talking a lot more to genealogists who are constantly thinking about these issues of uh, what gets covered up, what gets recovered, how do families deal with the emotional uh, fallout sometimes of discovering something about their family that's uncomfortable or new. Yeah. Um. The next question is, uh, 15 years after Katrina, what are the most fundamental changes to New Orleans? Uh, what are some important continuities? And finally, do you have a sense of how displaced Black New Orleans, New, New Orleanians, uh, have carried their district culture with them? Yeah, I think, um, I think we're still figuring out what's changing in New Orleans for a long time. New Orleans uh, was a place that was kind of stuck um, economically, politically. I, um, I think there are changes that are happening, but um, I think in some ways they are happening now, even in a way that's different maybe from even immediately post Katrina, that all that upheaval of Katrina, I think um, many of us thought for good or bad, it just changed, that the changes would be kind of immediate. and. and even if there were changes, I'm not sure that they stayed. I think we're still in this process of change. You know, I, I'm gonna use a, a kind of a metaphor, a friend of mine from Charleston a long time ago, uh, right after Katrina, she said, uh, you know, they experienced Hurricane Hugo, and that was maybe 10 years or even more before Katrina. And she said, you know, there are still Hugo houses in Charleston that were never repaired. And I think there's a similar process in New Orleans that even though we're 15 years out and you would have expected either some of the lessons or things, I think we're still living in the aftermath of it in a way that's hard to describe. And I'll say that I don't live there. So I, I even, there's a limit to what I can understand about how people are still living post Katrina, even though in some ways the nation feels like it's moved on. Um, certainly, I think there are new populations in New Orleans and um, it will be a question about how those new populations 
uh, are respectful of the old history and the older populations. And then literally there's an elderly population in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way in which the New Orleans that I knew because so many people left in my generation long before Katrina, there's a way in which there are things that are dying that um, we won't, it'll be a while before, I think, before people really realize that and understand that. So it's a very complex set of things that are still in motion there. Yeah. So there are several questions about Creole identity. Um, can you comment on Creole identity today? Uh, will you explore colorism more deeply in uh, the historical context? Yeah, I do plan to talk uh, more at length. This is, you know, just a little, little bit and more about uh, Creole identity. I think, um, you know, in some ways, what I described was kind of a snapshot of a moment. I do think that people um, are coming back to Creole identity. There are several groups in New Orleans that are exploring Creole identity and family and what it means um, in a much more critical way. Um, I think, you know, I would just say looking at the 20th century down to now, you know, the 20th century, a kind, some Creole families, maybe many who were sort of stuck in a kind of elitism and amid Jim Crow trying to hold on to their own status so that they were not harmed by Jim Crow. And then the 60s, a kind of rejection of those kinds of class, um, race-based, if you will, class distinctions. Um, and sort of post 60s into the 70s, and that's what I grew up in, a sort of rejection of Creole identity. But I think we're coming back to a, uh, trying to understand that history in a more complicated way um, now. And I think that there's both a grassroots um, movement, there are uh, several museums that deal with uh, history of free people of color, and um, again, these genealogists, um, genealogical organizations. And then I think for historians, we still have some work to do um, about moving beyond uh, romanticism about it into a kind of more detailed um, uh, discussion. So I, I think there's, uh, I don't know how much more I'm going to do in the book, but there, there definitely will be more. And I think there are also some historians who are going to bring us some more new thinking about that as well. Wonderful. Um, so the next one is um, a long question, but I'll read it out. Um, you spoke of how our memories of natural disasters like Betsy have been passed down among families in New Orleans. It made me think about memories of racial violence and how they're passed down among African Americans as a kind of practical, uh, practical memory. Mm. Do you see any relationship between the inheritance of memories about natural disasters and those of racial violence? Is there a convergence between the two? Oh, that's such a great question. Yes, I mean, I, I would definitely agree that both of them are ways of charting survival of charting, of warnings of, um, yeah, I, I, that's a great question, a great way to think about it. I'll say too that the other thing when I say that, you know, part of the reason I start with that opening and I plan to start the book with that opening of we know is because, you know, the comment of someone like Jenkins and I encountered that a lot was that, how could you be so stupid as to live in a place with a hurricane? How could you be so, you know? And I, what I want to claim is that we had knowledge of how to live there, of how to survive, of how to hold on to the things that we valued. It wasn't just that we were like, oh, is there a hurricane coming? Well, you know, we, we had skills to deal with those realities. And I think both in terms of uh, racial violence, right? You know, memories of racial violence and how do we survive and fight against them are about claiming our place in the nation, about we have the right to be here and you are not gonna remove that from us. So it's about, you know, when we claim these difficult histories, um, it's not because, uh, and of staying and of resisting, it's because we belong here and we are part of this place and we want to make it better. So I, I think that that's one way that both of these histories connect. With natural disasters, of course, we're living also with the unnatural consequences of climate change and forces that um, appear to be bigger than us. And, but I would say with both that for them to really be solved, racial violence, natural disaster, we have to be in um, collaboration with a community, and that could be a national community that is actively focused on fixing them. And so as we hold on to our ways of surviving, we have to um, 
hope that people will finally listen when we say that something is wrong here and how do we fix this and can we work together to fix it? Will you bring some resources to us? We have our resources. Are there more resources that we can have together? So. Absolutely. Uh, we have time for one last question. Um, are you planning to do any other comparison to other natural disasters in the race context, such as Hurricane Maria that devastated Puerto Rico and the delayed response of the US? This contrast with the relatively rapid response in case of Hurricane Harvey and Irma that hit mainland US? It's funny that it's a great question. And um, I have to say, I haven't thought about um, so one comparison that I do want to make is with New York City mm -hmm. and, um, excuse me, the Northeast. Um, and that's the one I'm focused on now. And I have to say, I, as Hurricane Maria was happening, I think I was so disturbed that I tried to block it out. I don't know if I was having a moment of, you know, just, I just couldn't believe we were there again. And so I, I thank you for the question because I do think I, I need to deal with it and contend with it. And you're making me realize that I just was overwhelmed by it. You know, watching that happen again, it was so, it's so frustrating. And, um, but so thank you for raising the question and reminding me that I um, need to think about that more deeply. Um, I think that I, in my mind, had ended the book with the sort of Hurricane Sandy in New York City and also the economic comparisons between New York and um, New Orleans that carried on for um, other centuries as well. But of course, New Orleans also faces the Caribbean. And that is uh, a way that the nation has often isolated New Orleans and saying it's more like the Caribbean. And of course, people don't see Puerto Rico as part of the nation. So that would be a great pivot in a way um, for my project as well. So thank you very much for that question. That's a great question. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you, Leslie, for the wonderful and moving presentation and for the different perspectives that you offered us. I also want to thank you, our audience, uh, for the terrific questions. I hope uh, you'll be able to join us for other Radcliffe uh, virtual programs. You can find out about future programs and watch videos of past events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. And with that, I thank you all again for joining us today and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.